um, try to share my screen and see if I can get my slides up here real fast. Um, it's loading. Okay, all right, looks like we did it. Let me just uh, try to get it in full screen here. Okay, so today uh, we're gonna talk about plastic. Um, and we have Linda and I and the, the Earth Day team have decided to call it zombie plastic. Now, why do we call it zombie plastic? Well, uh, because it does not die. Plastic, uh, plastic is the living dead of consumer products. Um, and uh, basically, plastic recycling, unfortunately, is, is a myth. Um, and not only that, but at every stage of its life cycle, um, from production to uh, to use by humans, to being quote unquote thrown away, plastic is uh, extremely toxic, and it is just not something that we can really continue to have in our uh, in our world. Um, so let's uh, let's take a look at some of the statistics here. So 380 million tons of plastic are produced each year. That's 500 billion plastic bags, 100 billion water bottles. In the U.S. alone, that's something like 300 water bottles per person. Um, so tons and tons and tons of plastic uh, being produced. So what happens? How, do, how is this stuff made? What happens when we use it? And what happens after that? So starting with production, there are two phases to plastic production. The first is extracting oil, right? Uh, plastic is a, a petroleum product. It's made from fossil fuels. Um, so all of the uh, problems that come from oil extraction are also associated with plastic. And after that, the oil is refined into plastic in one of these uh, massive refineries like the one on this slide here. Um, and both of these steps are massively problematic. Um, they create climate pollution. Um, oil drilling emits methane um, from the oil wells, uh, a recent uh, map, satellite map showed that oil fields uh, in the US are some of the top polluters in the entire world uh, in terms of climate. So that part's really bad. And air pollution. Um, so when the oil is refined in the refineries, there's the byproducts come out of the come out of the, the plant and go out into the surrounding community and cause uh, incredible health problems. Um, I want to highlight a, a place in Louisiana uh, called that's been dubbed Cancer Alley. Um, it has over 150 petrochemical plants, including plastic plants, and their cancer rates are 50 times the national average. And this is a direct result of the plants, the, the polluting plants, including plastic plants that are located in this area. It's really horrifying. It's quite, uh, quite shocking to think that in 2023 in the, you know, richest country in the world that we basically have places where the air is so poisonous that people get cancer because of it. Um, and on top of that, they wanna build another one. They wanna build another plastic plant in Cancer Alley. That's the thing, plastic production is expanding. Um, oil companies are betting uh, as, you know, as, as gas powered cars go, um, are getting regulated and other, you know, uses of fossil fuels are finally starting to to dwindle down, the, the industry is really betting that plastic is going to be their future. Um, so moving on to talk about why we cannot allow that. <laughs> so consumption, what is uh, what happens when we actually use these plastic products? Well, 50% of plastic, um, as I'm sure we're all aware, is uh, single use, right? Lots of single use plastic out there, um, water bottles, bags, uh, that kind of thing that you use it once and then you throw it away. And in fact, um, the average lifespan of a single use plastic product is only 15 minutes. We use it for 15 minutes and then we throw it away. Um, and here's a, a pretty shocking fact. Over the course of uh, the average human lifetime, we invest or, or we ingest rather over 40 pounds of plastic, which is equivalent to a credit card per week. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I was just reading some the recent papers on this, or at least articles summarizing papers, 
not exactly clear what this does to us, but it is clear that everybody has these microplastics in them um, and that whatever they're doing isn't good. <laughs> so, um, so when we produce them, they're toxic. When we use them, they're toxic. What about when we throw them away? And as you can see, I have them in big air, that in big air quotes here. Um, well, 91% of plastic is never recycled. Um, that's why I say it's really kind of a myth. Um, the vast majority of it um, ends up being uh, being landfilled or worse, as I'll uh, as I'll talk about in a moment here. Um, but when it is not recycled, it takes 200 to 450 years to decompose, right? And plastic really only has taken off in the last, you know, uh, seven or eight decades. So that means none of the plastic that has been generated since we really started doing this has decomposed. Uh, it's all still there. The living dead, right? Um, but really, there's no such thing as a way when it comes to plastic. So where does it go? Well, 75% of it goes to landfills. 15% of it is incinerated, which is yet another incredibly toxic process that uh, pollutes the, the communities around those incineration plants, really nasty stuff. Um, and then 10 million tons of it ends up being dumped in the ocean every year. That's a garbage truck load every minute. Okay, so <laughs> there's a big... Uh, Big list of reasons why plastic is fundamentally incompatible with life. Um, it's a pretty bold statement, I realize, but um, I really think it's true. Uh, it's just not something that is part of the natural world. Um, it's something that we have created, and it turns out that the, you know, the natural life and plastic are just not compatible. They just cannot be uh, be on the same planet together, really. Um, without causing major problems. So what do we do about this? Well, um, the angle that I'm going to talk about, and Linda's going to talk about what, what we can do personally and how we can reduce our personal plastic footprint. But what I always like to talk about is policy change, because I think that's a massive lever that ultimately uh, we need to pull in order to create uh, the scale of change that's needed. So talk about some solutions in the, in the policy realm, the systemic realm. Well, the biggest solution is to ban it, right? <laughs> we just need to ban it. Um, and uh, a number of municipalities in the US already have bans on plastic bags, which is the biggest and worst. So it's really good that we're actually moving in that direction. Uh, over 500 uh, localities in 28 states have uh, plastic bag bans or um, plastic bag taxes. Um, and nine states, including California, uh, have such bans. Um, yeah, you probably noticed that, you know, when you go to the grocery store these days, they don't offer you plastic bags, which is a direct result of this. Um, and it's great. Um, short of that, as I was mentioning, uh, you can tax them. Um, it's been shown that, you know, in, in areas where it's harder to get political support for a ban, uh, a tax can actually really help reduce uh, the amount of plastic bags that are consumed. And finally, we can pressure manufacturers. We can go right to Trader Joe's. We can go right to uh, Coca-Cola, uh, and, and tell them that we don't want, you know, plastic bags and plastic bottles <clears throat> anymore. And um, it's actually really effective. Consumer pressure uh, works really well uh, because they care. They pay attention to, to what their customers want. Um, the uh, organization Green America, which is basically focused exclusively on this kind of consumer advocacy, uh, has had, you know, direct uh, success stories where they'll tell Trader Joe's, you know, we want you to stop uh, stop putting plastic in this product. They get 600,000 people to send an email and they stop. So so it does kind of work, which is cool. Um, the final thing I want to talk about is something called extended producer responsibility. Um, if you ever get a chance to, uh, to speak up for this, this is a really, really good thing. Um, and the idea behind uh, EPR is that companies uh, need to pay for uh, disposing of plastic. They need to pay the costs of dealing with plastic after it's thrown away. Um, currently, obviously, that falls on uh, cities and counties and whoever deals with waste management uh, at the local level. Um, but if 
uh, producers were required to do that. That would really incentivize them to use less plastic and to invest uh, in alternatives. Uh, four states currently have EPR laws, uh, again, including California. So we're actually really doing a lot of stuff right. Um, which leaves me with the final, my final thought here, which is, you know, things are getting better, especially here in California, things are getting better. I, within my lifetime, within my relatively short lifetime, have seen, you know, plastic bags, you know, us go from plastic bags everywhere at Safeway and all over the place to a lot fewer plastic bags. Now, when I get my uh, tikka masala, microwavable tikka masala at Trader Joe's, it comes in a compostable container instead of a plastic one. So things are it, things are happening. We're moving in the right direction, um, at least here, at least in our little uh, blue bubbles that we live in. Um, but there's a lot more to be done. Um, there's really no, I hope I've convinced you, there's really no safe level of plastic in the environment. Um, there's a burrito place uh, uh, in Sharon Heights, El Cerrito, that I, that I really like. Whenever I come back up to the Bay, I go and get a burrito there. And they still have, uh, they still put everything in plastic bags. Um, restaurants are exempt from the plastic bag uh, issues, which is, which is unfortunate. And obviously, you know, there's still plastic silverware and there's plastic, you know, there's all kinds of plastic that's still, still making the rounds in our, in our system. And really we need to, you know, just get rid of it all. <laughs> that's where we need to go. Um, so we're making progress, uh, but we have, uh, we have more to do. And finally, I'll make a shameless plug for the Climate Action Now app. As many of you know, um, my day job is working on this app, which basically queues up a whole bunch of advocacy messages that you can send to Congress, to uh, to state legislators, to uh, the president, to companies, um, asking them to take take climate action. Um, and we have a whole list of actions related to plastic. Um, it's right there in the campaign section of the app. Um, so if you want to do something now in five minutes, uh, not right now while we're sitting in church, but <laughs> um, after the service, uh, go to the app store on your iPhone or Android, search for climate action now. It'll have this logo, uh, the black background with the white letters. Um, download this app and uh, it's really kind of easy and fun to take action. Um, so I hope you'll give that a try. Um, thank you so much. Back to you, Linda. Okay, thanks, Matthew. So Matthew sort of set the stage. Stay for the second hour because that's going to be a lot of fun talking about what we can do right today, right now, right in the next week, month, and year. I'm going to talk about something right now a little more global. And Jeff referred to it beautifully in his opening prayer. And I think you'll start to see the connection. OK, go back to the first reading you heard. Now I'm going to give you the 2023 Bible reading for Genesis 1, chapter, or chapter 1, 26 through 31. I think you'll recognize some things in it of me rewriting the Bible. And God said, let me make humans to evolve from crawling, climbing, and then walking upon the earth. Let them live as part of the fish in the sea, the fowl of the air, and the cattle, and all the earth, and every living thing. So God created humans in every form, male, female, and LGBTQ. And God said to them, eat your fruits and vegetables and multiply your thanksgiving for what the earth gives you and replenish the soil for you have taken nutrients from it. Subdue yourself to the needs of all the earth for it is your lifeblood of existence. And God said, Behold, I have provided herb-bearing seed, which each grows in its own ecosystem, and trees 
which each are providers of the oxygen you breathe, and to every beast of the earth and every fowl of the air and everything that creepeth upon the earth, here resides the web of life. I have created all of this to work in harmony, keepeth it so. And God saw everything that had been created, and behold, it worked as a living, breathing, evolving ecosystem, and it was good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Well, that's a little bit different take on Bible readings. I think you'll see that the first message that you got when I read the one from the King James Version, that we were all, anybody here who was grown up Christian, you were sort of steeped in that whole tradition of dominate, subdue. The earth is here for you. And through this, you know, we get this regular ethos. It says, go out, conquer the West, you know, tame those wild lands. So guess what we did? We did that. And in the process, we ended up with things, and here's the, one of the prime examples, like wildfires. Well, guess what? People are looking at that and saying, well, wait a minute, how, how come our wildfires are so bad? Well, I can tell you, I work for the Forest Service. <laughs> I can tell you some of the things that we did. When they went out and they did clear cutting, so there's your first hint right there, they clear cut. Now they went in and they replanted. And they said, oh, okay, what gives us the biggest bang for the buck? Okay, that's dug fir. We're going to replant this whole hillside in dug fir. That wasn't what was growing there. It wasn't all dug fir. Now they just planted all dug fir. Okay, so we start to see that's the dominating thing. That's the subduing. Let's have the land do what we want. Well, now we've ended up with lands that aren't as healthy. We've ended up with things that aren't growing the way they should because we've suppressed all these wildfires and we've created great, you know, loads of dead things on the, on the land. The other thing, uh, Smokey the Bear, that was another one, you know, let's stop those wildfires. Well, guess what? Forest Service is now sort of banned Smokey the Bear. Smokey the Bear is in a back closet right now and they don't allow it to come out. <laughs> so you can see that it, we have started to learn we're not there yet. So when you look at the statement of to have dominion, it kind of implies, well, we're stronger, we're wiser. In fact, we're really babes in the wood on this one. You know, the earth really knows what it's doing. And our job is to think like the earth to think like we're part of what's out there. And that second reading, the rewritten reading, tries to address what if we came to look at life and our role here on this earth completely differently, no longer dominion, no longer subdue, but what if we start to think of us as just part of a whole ecosystem? Now, some ways we have kind of started, and I remember I talked about the Forest Service and their clear cutting and the replanting all uh, dug fir. Well, they don't do that anymore. 
What they do now is they say, oh, that's a drainage there. Oh, we need to plant a tree that grows in a drainage. So they do. Those are now mixed forests that they're planting. That's much more in line with what it always used to be. What are they doing on wildfires? They don't want to tell you, but I think a lot of you may already know. They let them burn. They don't go out there. They fight to save people's houses. They fight to save structures. But in the rest of the areas, their philosophy now is we need to let it burn. It doesn't always work out well, but it is going to take 100 years, maybe 200, to get to now that natural cycle of burning. But there at least we're waking up to the fact we need to be part of what the natural cycle is. Now, I worked down at the wetlands for Palo Alto Baylands. Well, actually over in the uh, east side, too, at the San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuge. They put in all the salt marshes. Excuse me. They put in all the salt ponds. Okay. So they blocked off the flow of the bay, and they put in a salt pond. And now they're saying, OK, we've changed things a little too much. It rains. Oh, well, we haven't got that salt marsh that kind of takes up all that rainwater that now gets dumped in. We're getting a little bit of flooding here. OK, so as these salt ponds get to be turned over to the refuge, the refuge is looking at how do we bring them back to be a salt marsh? Well, guess what? They take that, what used to be completely flat, to be a salt pond, and they go in and they say, oh, what does a slough look like? Uh, kind of windy. Well, okay, let's just put a little slough in there. Now, when they break the levee, Nature takes care of it. Nature comes in. Nature brings in little bits of pickleweed, brings in little bits of salt grass, little bits of cord grass. And you come back 10 years later, and it looks like a salt marsh. Because nature knows how to cycle. It knows what to do. Now, you're kind of wondering, where are we going with this? Well, what if we started from children with a different ethos? What if children grew up thinking, I'm part of this ecosystem, not dominating I really do think we need to rewrite Genesis. We need to come up with some better lines in Genesis than what's there. So what if the children, instead of throwing rocks at animals, stepping on ants, actually, no, they actually stomp on ants. They don't step on them, they stomp on them. What if they started to see everything as being part of it and that this is how they grow up. Yeah, what a miracle this would be to see. What if we adults started looking at things a little differently? The garbage, and Matthew talked about the garbage and how there really is no away with garbage. It's kind of always there. What if we looked at what we discard and we say, well, wait a minute, this needs to be part of a circular system. Now, that's what life out there is actually like. You have a bird, little chick being born, the shell. Shell gets dropped on the ground. 
Shell starts to go back into the earth, replenishing the calcium in the earth. Little chick grows up into a bird. Little bird drops feathers. Guess what? The feathers get, get to be used by other birds to make nests. So, or, or they go down and they become part of the earth. Bird dies, it gets cycled back into the earth. So that circular cycle is what the earth does. And what if we started viewing ourselves and what we have as circular? There isn't any way, that there isn't this garbage. We'd go into grocery stores, we'd go into any kind of store, and you'd look at it, you'd have a whole different view. I challenge you the next time you go into a store to buy something, to look around and think, okay, what can I buy here that's circular? It's going to go around. It's going to be remade. It's going to, you know, we're not just going to be a single use item. So let's get back to what does this have to do with plastics? Well, do plastics fit, fit the model of being part of the earth? We've gone in and we've ripped it out of the earth. Now we've stuck it in a, a chemical plant and we've processed it. None of this seems very natural to me. And we've shifted it and we've consumed 15 minutes. Remember our 15 minutes. And then we throw it away, and not much of it can be recycled. So that's what I'm coming back to. You know, if we start to have this different view of life, we're going to start to see plastics in a different way. And trying to think about that circular idea of everything should be circular. And that's why I loved when Matthew put up that idea that the companies have to be responsible for whatever garbage it is that's created by their product. They did that in Switzerland. And all at once, the company started thinking, wait a minute, we don't want to dispose of all this stuff. How can we make it circular? The whole idea, we are part of the circle of life. Now, if you take anything away, I hope that you, that idea is what you go out and start looking at life as. Amen. <laughs>